Well, I definitely have a lot more respect for Dude Perfect because that one shot took a while. But honestly, I just thought it would kind of look cool. Now, before we get into how symmetry can be used to solve for the final configuration of this game, or why bubbles are shaped the way that they are, we need some background. I don't think many people need an explanation as to why that was symmetric. Symmetry is something that even children can grasp, yet it's also studied by PhDs in mathematics. So it gets quite advanced and it's everywhere. The symmetry can be seen in this whiteboard, or it's often captured in cool fractal designs and artwork. It's found all over the place in nature or in structures built around the world. It exists in music, in molecules, and even across mathematics and numbers in ways you likely have never even thought about. One of the most classic examples of symmetry is found within a Rubik's Cube, which I'm not going to dive too much into, but let me ask you this. How many moves, at the minimum, would it take to solve this? Well, the answer is I don't know. But I do know the answer is no more than 20. 20 is known as God's number for a 3x3 Rubik's Cube, which means of the 43 quintillion ways this cube can be arranged, all of them are no more than 20 moves away from being solved. And it took several Google supercomputers to figure this out. In fact, the calculations it had to run would have taken a typical PC about 35 years to figure out. God's number for a 2x2 cube is 11, and for a 4x4 or anything above, it's unknown as of now. Now, in order to understand what this has to do with symmetry, we have to rethink what symmetry really is. So let's go back to one of me and look at this from a new perspective. So here we have a triangle, and here we have a capital I. Both are symmetric, of course, but which one is more symmetric? So yeah, now we need some definitions, or maybe a new question. I'm going to start with this I and ask something else instead. How many ways can I rigidly move this around in space such that after the transformation, it ends up just looking the same as it did before? Well, one thing I can do is rotate it 180 degrees, which I'll call R180. I can reflect it vertically 180 degrees, which I'll call FV for vertical flip. And I can reflect it horizontally 180 degrees, which I'll call FH for horizontal flip. And there's one more that's much more subtle. I can do nothing, which I'll call E. So this is four symmetries. Any other way you rigidly transform it will just be the same as one of the four transformations we already covered. The triangle, on the other hand, has six symmetries. Two rotations, three reflections, and the do nothing element. So we could say it's more symmetric than the eye. Now you should be able to see that symmetry is a dynamic property, not a static one. And now we have some of the tools to start really investigating symmetries of basic objects. If we go to our sponsor site, we can see another example, like which one of these two shapes are more symmetric. Now we said the triangle has six symmetries, and with this other shape, because of the external line segments, you can't reflect it and leave it unchanged. So it only has rotational symmetries, six to be exact. So in fact, it's a tie. But now let's go back to this eye and really look at the transformations. Let's assign a letter to each corner, then perform a horizontal flip, followed by a vertical flip. You'll know this is the same as taking the original configuration and just turning it 180 degrees. In fact, we could say that performing that horizontal flip and then a vertical flip is the same as the 180 degree rotation. So now we're developing a mathematical way to represent these symmetries. Now what we're going to do is actually make a table that has all four moves going across the top and down along the side. Now we can fill in the middle spot here that says FH followed by FV yields the rotational symmetry. If I perform maybe a 180 degree rotation followed by another, I get the original configuration meaning I could say R180 on R180 is just E, that do nothing element. Flipping vertically and then doing nothing is the same as, well, flipping vertically, of course. And I can fill out this entire table. And what you'll see is everything in the table is just one of the four symmetries we originally found. The fact that any two symmetries just yield another makes this set a group. Well, not totally. This is actually one of four criteria that must be met for a set to be a group. But in our case, it definitely is a group, and group theory is the branch of mathematics that really dives into symmetry. So let's look closely at that table we just made because we're about to use it to analyze a game in a way that's not really obvious at first. One thing you'll notice is the table is symmetric about the diagonal, which means doing FH followed by R180 gets us a symmetry that's the same as doing R180 first, then FH. 
Order doesn't matter just like with multiplication. Even when we apply many symmetries, the order does not matter. Note this isn't always true or required for a group. Like let's take an example of a square where I've just colored the corner so you can track them easily. Now if we perform a 90 degree rotation followed by a vertical flip, we end in this configuration. But if we start the same way as before and first do the vertical flip, then the 90 degree rotation, you see it's a different outcome. So not all objects have this kind of commutative property of order not mattering, but our capital I in this case does. Next, and more importantly, if we go back to our table and ignore that do nothing element real quick, if we look at any pair of different moves, you'll notice they always yield the third. Doing R180 then FH yields the other one FV. FV then R180 is FH and so on. And lastly, note that performing all three symmetries in any order is always the same as doing nothing. This is because doing any two moves always yields the third. We can then compose both sides with that same resultant symmetry. And if we look at our table, doing the same move twice is the same as doing nothing. Okay, so again, doing any three moves is the same as doing nothing. This is crucial to remember, so I'm going to rename those three moves just X, Y, and Z and keep this rule on the screen. Now let's go back to our sponsor site real quick, whose group theory course includes an example on peg solitaire. Since we know soli is a Latin root meaning no, and ter means friends, I naturally have one for us to play with. Now, the game is fairly simple. Start with all pegs filled except for the middle one. The only move you can do is jump one peg at a time into a blank space. So I can move this here, and as a result, you take away the peg that you jumped over. We can also do vertical jumps, but that's it. One jump at a time, and the goal is to get down to a single peg left. Now, the question we'll answer using group theory is when there's one peg remaining, where can it possibly be? After completing the game you just saw, my last peg was here, but could it have been anywhere else? When doing analysis like this, it's often helpful to figure out what cannot change throughout the game or what remains constant although that isn't always easy to find, unfortunately. So for example, is the number of pegs on the board constant as we play? Of course not. What about the largest number of consecutive blank spaces? Well, no, that changes too. To answer, let's first label every single spot on the board with an X, Y, or Z, such that any three consecutive spots have different letters. Luckily, Brilliant has done this for us though. Now, when we start the game, the middle spot is the only one that's blank, so we'll ignore that. What we need to do now is essentially multiply every other space using the rules from that symmetry of the capital I, where the three main dynamic symmetries can just be called X, Y, and Z. So let's do the top row. What is X times Y times Z using those rules? Well, I told you I'd keep this on the screen for a reason. This gets us that E element. The second row multiplies to get us the same thing since we said order does not matter. In fact, every single row or column of three spaces just yields E. All this leaves us with is X and Z remaining. If we do that multiplication, we know that X times Z yields Y. Remember, doing any two moves always yielded the third. So multiplying everything filled on this board gives us a bunch of E's followed by a Y. And doing nothing a bunch of times than performing whatever the Y move was just gives us Y. Okay, now let's do our first move, which takes away one peg from the board, and relook at that picture, which now has two blank spaces. If we multiply everything again, we have a bunch of X, Y, and Zs in a row, which don't really matter. If we group them properly, what's left is just a Y, meaning again, the entire multiplication is Y, like it was before. In fact, no matter how many moves you do, this multiplication using the product of symmetries is always the same for this game. Meaning when you have one peg left, it's got to land in a spot labeled Y. So you see, symmetry can appear in very unusual ways. And to dig a little deeper, although we've seen it must end in a Y location, it cannot end at this spot, for example, since due to the symmetry of the board, that would mean it could end in this location, which is clearly impossible since it's not labeled Y. So there's your first real application of symmetry. But now let's move on to optimization because symmetry appears here a lot. Take something as simple as blowing a bubble. 
We know as soon as a bubble leaves the wand, it snaps into a sphere. And what's happening is nature is actually solving an optimization problem involving symmetry. Although there's a lot of science behind this process, the large scale is where the interesting optimization lies. Essentially, the soap film wants to get smaller in terms of surface area. It wants to be as small as possible, yet it still has to hold a fixed volume of air, the amount that you blew into it. So we have a fixed volume, and we want to minimize the surface area. It's basically like a calculus one problem. And it turns out the shape that minimizes that area is a sphere, aka the most symmetric three-dimensional object optimizes our problem. So if you need to hold a certain volume of liquid, but you want to use the least amount of material, then the best idea is to make a sphere. Again, the sphere is the most symmetric three-dimensional object. And the reason is because, well, for one, it has infinitely many symmetries. I could turn this one degree a certain direction, I could turn it 17.234 degrees another direction, and it remains unchanged if we at least ignore the patterns on this ball for now. So it's not an accident that the bubbles are shaped the way that they are, because when it comes to optimization, the solutions are often very symmetric. I mean, just on this topic of bubbles, if you dip a cubic frame into a soap solution, what you'll see is nature finding a minimum surface area such that the soap solution clings to all of the sides. We can see a shape that clearly has symmetry to it and meets at a small square film in the middle. Although you might expect everything to meet at a point in the middle, it turns out that's actually not the optimum solution. Or maybe you've seen when two bubbles come into contact, they make this double bubble-like structure. Well, about two decades ago, the double bubble conjecture was solved, proving that the best way to enclose and separate two given volumes such that you have a minimum surface area is in fact with a standard double bubble, which always meets at an angle of 120 degrees. It took mathematicians hundreds of years to figure this out, and it takes nature less than a second. Now, let's switch gears to what many would call a basic high school math question. Let's solve the equation x to the fifth equals negative one. Well, I'm sure many of you will see this and say, hey, the answer is negative one. And you're not wrong, but you're missing four other solutions, and it turns out all of these can be found on a pentagon in the complex plane. After some rounding, these solutions come out to 0.81 plus 0.59i, negative 0.31 plus 0.95i, and then essentially the same two answers with a negative in front of the imaginary part. Any of these to the fifth power, if we did not round though, would be negative one. Now, if we go with a complex plane, which just has a real axis and an imaginary axis, and we put a circle with a radius of one on it, we find something interesting. Our first solution of 0.81 plus 0.59i is found here. Basically just like 0.81 comma 0.59 located on an xy axis. Our next point of negative 0.31 plus 0.95i can be found here. The next has the exact same real value, but a negative imaginary value as the previous solution. And the same goes for the last solution compared to the first. But we can't forget that easiest solution we found of negative one, which has no imaginary component. All of our solutions land on this circle, and as you can see, they form a pentagon. Now, if we look at this first point, it's exactly 36 degrees from the real axis. So let's see what happens if we put a dot here and rotate it about the origin five times by 36 degrees. The first rotation of 36 degrees obviously gets us to that point. The second rotation gets us to 72 degrees. The next rotation lands at that second solution. Four rotations gets to 144, and five rotations gets us to 180 degrees, aka the point negative one. So our x solution, rotated five times about the origin, lands us at negative one. Well, that wasn't a coincidence, as you'll see with the second solution. It's located at 108 degrees, and if we again start at positive one, and do one, two, three, four, five rotations of 108 degrees, we land at that same place. So now we can really see why these are all solutions. If you pick somewhere on the circle, it has some associated complex value and angle. Then if we multiply any complex number by our number here, it ends up rotating that complex number, the degree value we see here. So if we multiply that value by itself, let's say, we get another complex number, and if we put it on the circle, we can see it really is the same as rotating the original by its own degree value. And now you can graphically see why i times itself is negative one, 
since I is 90 degrees from the origin, multiplying by itself rotates another 90 degrees, getting us to negative 1. So essentially our original problem ended up finding the values between 0 and 360, where when you apply 5 rotations of those degree values, you land at minus 1 plus 0i. The basics of this alone has applications in engineering, which I've talked about many times before. But for example, if you have like two voltage signals that are separated by maybe 90 degrees, that can be represented using imaginary numbers because that translation that you physically see can be related to the rotations we saw earlier. In terms of physics, in 1915, David Hilbert asked for Emmy Noether's help in the pursuit of understanding the underlying mathematics of general relativity developed by Einstein. Along the way, she ended up proving what is now known as Noether's theorem, which on a very surface level says that symmetries in a physical system imply an existing conservation law. And this has been regarded as one of the most important mathematical theorems in guiding modern physics. Years later, physicist Murray Gell-Mann made significant contributions to the quark as he found symmetric patterns that could classify certain particles. And he ended up winning the Nobel Prize in 1969. And going back to our x to the fifth example, as we all know the quadratic formula is something where given any quadratic, you can just plug in the coefficients and find the zeros. However, you may not know that there's also one of these for a cubic function, but it's much more hectic, which is probably why most of us don't learn it in school. But for a long time, it was a big question of whether one of these existed for a fifth degree polynomial. Well, it was actually proven centuries ago that no such formula exists. This was done using concepts within group theory, as well as some others that I'm not going to go into. So we've seen various examples of symmetry in this video, but the subject obviously goes much deeper. As we've seen, symmetry allows us to think of mathematical and physical problems in a completely different way. Whether it be puzzles that involve hidden mathematical relationships, the mathematical description of musical sound, or taking a new approach to number theory, which is used for modern day cryptography. Symmetry can be found in places you may never have thought of. And for those who want a deeper understanding of all this and more, Brilliant offers a wide variety of math courses, including one on, of course, group theory. Brilliant is an online educational platform that guides you through math and science courses of your choosing, teaching new concepts while giving you constant practice problems along the way. Brilliant will test your knowledge throughout any course to make sure you're ready to move on, but they'll also teach you how to think about advanced concepts in a clever way. So if you want to get started with group theory right now and learn, for example, why this puzzle is impossible to solve due to underlying symmetries, or if instead you want to learn number theory all the way to artificial neural networks, then click the link in the description below or go to brilliant.org slash major prep. Additionally, the first 200 people to sign up get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything, and I'll see you all in the next video.